Well, that's start. a good first thing to say on the recording. <laughs> I don't know what this book is about. I don't remember the book. <laughs> okay, I, should I introduce this one? Today gotcha. we are doing The Abortion and Historical Romance 1966 by Richard Brodigan. I believe I have read every published poem Brodigan ever put out. In, actually, and a book that was put out posthumously. This is the first novel of his that I ever read, and I want to thank you guys so much for reading it with me, because I would, I can tolerate his poetry alone, but I actually appreciate having company on this one. Why did you choose this one? Well, he had other books. He had one about trout fishing in America. I found uh, this title deeply amusing. That is why I selected this book. Yes, his two most famous novels are uh, Trout Fishing in America and In Watermelon Sugar. So is he supposed to be the 33-year-old or 32-year-old, 31-year-old? Excuse me, is he supposed to be 31 on that cover? Uh, because there's like this young brunette girl and then this old man and he is not 31 and should not be hooking up with her. People looked older in those days. That's, I mean, that's actually him. Yeah. Yes. Is he 31 in this book? Is that the age stated in the yeah, book? Yeah, he's 31. Mm. Yeah, good point. I don't know. Well, okay, I mean, that's one of my first questions, actually. So, did this really happen to Brodigan? How real is this? Is this fiction or nonfiction? What do you I think? I don't know what to believe. I don't know. Ever since Richard Engel and... Does Aaron this library actually exist? What? Does this library actually exist? Right? That's yeah, part of the I question. I think it's a metaphor. But it's San Francisco, so maybe it exists. That sounds like something they'd have. A, a library for books that no one will ever read and no one will ever look at again. Um, I got the impression that he had really been through this. Really? The abortion part or the library? Okay, so yeah, I was asking all those questions, right? Is this metaphor? Is this magical fiction or whatever they call it? I feel like a lot of the facts here happened, but they happened through Brodigan's poetic eyes. You know, he sees magic everywhere. So I even feel like he may have worked at a library, but his imagination did this to his experience of working in that library. So is there actually a library that has books no one will ever read or look at again that where they store whatever you want to give them? I think there are okay. libraries. I think most books in libraries are never going to be read. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? But they're not kept in caves. They would just sell them to me at the book sale. You say that, but then we have um, New York Public Library. Well, and I was going to say the... You know, library of the Congress? What is the United States Library called? The Library of Congress where they keep all of our tweets. Thank you, yes. Greer and I tried to use it as an internet cafe in 2004. Oh, yes. It didn't work, and it smelled like pee-pee. <laughs> pee-pee. And they were really resentful of our, our just trying to apply for jobs there. I, re I, I had forgotten that. Oh, my God. I remember that now. Okay, so no. about that. I thought, okay, he may, I have I didn't I intentionally didn't read anything from his um biography. Like I didn't even read his Wikipedia page. But I got really? the impression you, Yeah, I didn't I mean I've read it in the past, but I didn't read it in preparation for this discussion on purpose. Because of my question okay, about this. Huh? Actually, what? Vita? Oh, it's breaking up. Oh, whoops, it's breaking up? Okay. Well, here's my thing. So, all right, about the library and how it works, I thought that that was a metaphor for the author's mind, or I felt like that was Brodigan saying that's how he sees his role in the world. Kind of an acceptor or a repository of stories and moments that maybe other people will never read. I like that. I wasn't no, I sure, but that was when I was trying to, you know, pinpoint the metaphor. I, that's what I was thinking. Okay. Oh, Stop it. 
I'm on a page book right now. Do you want me to do the what it's really about or should, well, I mean, I think it's not whatever, but Yeah, sure. I'd love to know. So, so it says right here, we began developing the story in nineteen sixty six. Vida it might be a small town in Oregon along the McKenzie River. Um where years earlier Isn't somebody it named Lisa spurned his declaration of love. The Library for Unpublished Manuscripts was based on Brodigan's experience with the uh, Presidio Beach, Presidio? Oh, Presidio. No. Oh, branch of the San Francisco Public Library. Um, okay. Uh, Vida was based on Janice Meisner, his real life girlfriend. And the trip to Mexico was based on his research. I'm surprised that that was the only part that was made up. The rest of it seemed yeah. embellished, and that was the part that was real. Um, he didn't. He, it says he didn't visit an abortion clinic while he was down there. Huh. Uh, I thought that part was factual. I did too. I mean, I feel like he did it not. Let me be clear. Like I felt like sure, certainly he may have pieced these different moments together into the novel. I'm not sure that they all happened together as one complete story. Yeah. But yeah, no, I felt like this was based on real stuff. Maybe I could be wrong. Yeah, I was sure that his girlfriends had lots of abortions. <laughs> um <laughs> But there's no evidence that he actually participated in an abortion with anyone. I stand corrected. I thought he was like a a real life Andy Botwin. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm a little disappointed. That wasn't cool. Um. All right. Sorry. I mean to interrupt. So, do we like this book? Yes. I fucking love this book. I love everything Brodigan says. Everything. I like. I am. A, I'm a super fan. I'm a super fan of two writers, and Brodigan is one of them. So. I thought it might have loved it. I don't know. Sam. Um. <laughs> Sam's been replaced by vacuum cleaners. <laughs> That's how I help you. Do you like the book? Did you finish the book? I. I yeah, it was good. Did you read it? Well, I know her name is Vita and not Vita, so what does that tell you? I think it's Vita. No, because he asked her, is it Vita? Is it Vita or is it Vita? I thought it was Vita. I thought yeah. it was Vita. Rare because what is it? Too easy to remember. I think it's addressed in the book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's why I keep oh, saying it. I turned right to it. Crazy. My page forty five. Do you like to be called Vida or Vida? That made her smile. Vida. Vida. Oh, okay. My apologies. Um. Oh, so the arms go up. Her point has been made. Do you guys all have this copy? It looks like this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we can do page numbers. Yeah, that can. one. Was this self-published? I don't think so. I think that people were publishing him. Was it? No, you're probably right. No, it was made by, let's see. Mm -hmm. Simon and Schuster. Um, Simon and Schuster. Okay, oh, really? I want to hear from people who didn't like it. I would, I would love to hear why you didn't like it. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Ashley didn't like it, but she's not here, so we'll never know. Why didn't she like it? Mm. I don't think Ashley likes any book by anyone that's not being productive. That's not being Say that again. You guys, I'm sorry. Like, with my cold, like, my hearing's kind of bad. I'm sorry no, if I'm asking. Don't that either. Um, I don't think Ashley likes books when people are not very productive. She, oh. for instance, she hates The Catcher in the Rye because Holden Caulfield is just sort of meandering around town being useless. And Ah, okay. What did she like about us? <laughs> I'm sure she likes us. <laughs> Why does she like us? Sam and I are related to her, so I think she just kind of does what she can with us. I am very proactive, thank you. She says from a pillow. That brings up a really good point. I wanted to ask you guys about this. So for me, 
it was so wonderful to read a book that um, was not plot driven. Yeah. And so I worried actually. I think you told me Ashley read it in two days. This book should be read like an aged bottle bottle of Bordeaux should be consumed. Okay, like very slowly you savor it. It's poetry. So I mean, I don't. You can't read really speed read through it. Hmm. And why are you feeling? Like, um, I finished an airplane today. Oh, so it's fresh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I remember everything. Forty-five minute flight here. Did you stare at the wing to find a coffee stain on the wing. Oh, that was actually kind of creepy. As the plane was landing, he was like describing the airplane like this is not boding well for me. <laughs> uh, that's kind of cool. I like that. Then you're it's like surround sound. Mm. Uh, then I a pilot continually. Uh, talking um, about what was happening. <laughs> You're saying that you should read this book slowly. Um, I agree with that. Okay. It's, you it's know how on the email chain I was asking like how would you categorize this book and I finally landed on I would describe this as I don't know if it's a real word but poetic narrative. I think it's a, I think it's a long poem and yeah. I'm saying that based on my experience of having read so many of his poems, like, I can now, de because I have that background, I guess, I could detect that each paragraph or each chapter was written in exactly the same kind of way that he composes um, self-standing poems in the collections. So, yeah. Um, and, yeah, so I don't think you could speed read this and like it. You can't speed read poetry because the, the gut of the poem is not in the plot. It's in the words and the moments and you know, the beats. Let's see. So, okay. Yeah, okay. Do you have to like poetry, you think, to like this book? I don't know. I mean, that was actually another question I wanted to ask you guys. Has anybody, like, I am not a big poetry reader at all. But have any of you ever read it by choice? Yeah. Um, I poetry. Yeah. Robert Frost. Stop, Pete. Uh, Shel Silverstein. Yeah. <laughs> I read the Bronte sisters' poems. But, um, the Brontes. I love them, Sam. They are just... But then you criticize me for loving Pride and Prejudice. I don't criticize you for liking Pride and Prejudice. I just think that... You can't even say it without a tone. <laughs> you know, the Bronte sisters didn't like uh, Jane Austen. I know, that's what I was referring to. The passion, romance, or whatever, or something like that. It's quite like unknown. Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears rivalry. Yeah, but I mean, years apart, but yes. And so, yeah. <laughs> Casey, what um, did you like about it? I... I mean, I, I read it the way you read it as poetry, and I, I just liked the quietness of how he writes. I thought it was smooth, like, I think he writes gently, and I just thought it was pretty writing, pretty... It was, just, it was soft. I liked, I liked how soft it was. But it was... What did I say when we actually read it, when I was reading it? It was like um, a kind Bukowski. <laughs> like how Bukowski kind of sees things for just what they are. I think he just sees it he doesn't reflect too much on it, he doesn't read too much into things, he just kind of experiences things, moves on. Like, even his girlfriend, like, Vita's, like, the most gorgeous person. He doesn't really think too much about it. He knows it, it's a fact, he just moves on. It's like, they both seem to have a little bit of, uh, um, just, like, social disconnect. Yeah. But his social disconnect is kind. And it's just, I don't know, he has kind of a sweet uh, Asperger's going on. He's <laughs> but in general, I like how he writes. Like, I just like the, um, the gentleness of how he, how he writes sentences. I like uh, that. Yeah, we've described him before, I think, as a non-misogynistic beat. Yeah. I stand by that. I want him just to keep talking about the people who came in. Yeah, that's Oh, cool. yeah! Sam... 
you know how I asked what everybody's favorite book title was? Did you pick the book title called Sam, Sam, Sam? <laughs> no, what? <laughs> <laughs> There's a chapter called, like, the 23, and it's about 23 books that were brought in. And I yeah. said, hey, does everybody have, like, a favorite book title? And one of the titles um, is Sam, Sam, Sam. I think that what we've just revealed here is that Sam did not savor this like a Bordeaux. She shotgunned it like, like Natty Light. <laughs> <laughs> so I did shop last night, and I did not know that people take that long to take a shot. I just thought you it? went it up and took it. What? You were talking about how I shotgun a beer. I was talking about how last night I took a shot. I took lemon drops, and I, like... While the other girls were still finishing theirs, I was down at the end of the bar already. Very proud of you, Sam. I feel like I, that's how I did this book. My that's what it is. Can I tell you guys my favorite book title? Yes. yes. What page are you on? Page 14 in my copy, Growing Flowers by Candlelight in Hotel Rooms. Yes, I love that one. Oh, oh that was a world one. one. I don't know. I like Snow... Wait, what was it? Snow Pages? Oh, that, the guy that just brought in blank pages of nothing? Yeah. Woman. Oh, woman. Oh, yeah, it was a woman. You're right. Whoa, man. Um, oh, I also like the one. Can I and add? I just like Foster. I just wanted them to keep talking about Foster. Oh, yeah, like, which was your favorite, and which one would you want to read? They don't I have to be the same. I want to read He Kissed All Night by Susan Marger, the old woman that came in, and she said, it's about kissing, she said. I guess she was too old for any subterfuge now. <laughs> <laughs> See, I no, love all of these. I thought they were all poems. The, all the little books were little poems? Like little haikus? Yeah, haikus? these are all like little Brodigan poems. Yeah. Oh, that's cute. Um, let's see. Your clothes are dead. That's like my autobiography title. What's the uh, I, think, I think I wanted to read Leather Clothes and the History of Man. I appreciated that one. Everything was written on leather. <laughs> the Queen of Darkness, pal. That's funny. Do you know... I don't, I don't want to read that one, though. He had a thing on page 44, sorry, where he says... The Vita comes in and she tells him, like, how beautiful she is and what a burden that is to be so beautiful. Um... And he's gonna say something, but then he decides against it and goes, "It's not really what I, it's not what she wanted to hear, and that wasn't really what I wanted to say." After all, I have a little more sense than that. We both didn't want to hear what I first thought of telling her. Uh, I highlighted that part because I thought, you know, every time on the news when people say something ignorant or racist, I think that maybe they should have this on their wall. Like, maybe the American people don't want to think, hear your first thought. Maybe think a little harder and say your second thought. So you, oh, you just like send that. a bunch of flowers to CNN and Fox News? Yeah, just in this little part of it. And because, yes. you know, everybody does that. Everybody sort of they think it'd be, oh, okay, I'm going to think of the thing. That, like, that's what stereotypes are for, right? Like, you go to the, the fastest thing that's filed in your head, and then but they say it a lot. So. But doesn't that contradict everything Second City and improv teaches you? Um, no, but you... Say hi. Say hi. Are... I'm not supposed to think. I don't know. I don't think you're very good at improv if you're thinking only racist things all the time. Well, I know. I'm just saying that you're supposed to say whatever's in your head. Well, yeah. I don't think that the news people are. Yeah, you're right. It, I'm probably being too hard on them. They're on TV like 48 hours at a time. Hey, Sydney, unfortunately my page numbering is different. So what did he say that was not the thing that anybody wanted to say or hear? Okay, let's find out. I don't remember. I didn't highlight that part. I right. remember that moment, although I can't find it in my text. And my interpretation of that was I think he had said something commonplace. Yes. So she came in, and she was beautiful, and that's really hard on her. And he said, I was going to tell her that she was a beautiful girl, and she shouldn't feel bad about it that she was all wrong in denouncing herself. But then I changed my mind instantly. Um, and he asked her name instead. So Okay, okay. I think that probably she gets asked that a lot. Like, but you're so pretty. Don't worry about it. You're so pretty. 
probably like, oh no, that's, that's probably annoying. Uh, he never really talked about why he loved her, though. Stop it. Uh, did he say he loved her? her insecurity. Oh. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if they say, I love you. Do they? Because of her insecurity. Does he say oh, that? Was, he says, she, was she insecure? Yeah, she, about her body. Like, he kept but, talking about how she was slowly becoming less insecure, and she was 80% over, uh, more confident than when she walked in, but there was still at 20%, which was um, so like tempting or whatever, or whatever you said. But is that insecure of her body or insecure of people's real interest in her? They're not actually I interested in her, they're in the body, and so it's like... I guess maybe it but doesn't. But I feel like he's also insecure, and he fears the war around him, and that's why he loves the library where he's safe. <laughs> and it was this girl who also has insecurity and is willing to open up to him. Hey, guys, him. I have to go. I'm sorry. My parents are in town. Hey, baby. Hey, hey, I want to see Pete first. What? I want to see Pete. Oh. <laughs> Did you, Pete, get back here! Did you really just run behind the couch? Pete, Monkey Man! You got your ball! Oh, he's, here's that! Monkey Man! Hi! Trying to, he's trying to find him. He doesn't see 2D. He's freaking he's out! So Did you not see him? Oh, he went behind the computer! He went on the computer? The, he just ran behind the computer to try to find you. Oh, my man. Oh, that's okay. Frankie just came out. Here, look. Oh, wait. She He's away. really upset. He's trying to find you. Aw, poor dude. All right, well, just come on out here, okay? You have a house now. <laughs> Casey, congratulations, girl. I can't even believe it. Congrats. Yeah. Hot tub party. Hot tub party in my car. Wait, you're putting koi right. in there? Won't they melt? Don't put fish in there. Why would a... No, I'm kidding. No. I'm just... Okay, I gotta go. Yeah, I... Yeah, all right. Bye, guys. Love you. Bye. Bye. Go, bro. Bye, down. Casey. Bye. Oh, Casey's gone. She's gone. It's sad. Ah, I should read the Hindenburg poem. Okay. Oh. It's one of those that I sent you guys. It's not out of this book. So I actually just watched a Netflix documentary on the Hindenburg. Do you guys know about this historical event? Yeah, I do. You know about I didn't really know about it. What, about the Hindenburg? Yeah. They stupidly filled it with, what, like, something flammable, flammable blip, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was a Nazi uh -huh. airship, 1937. It was the size of the Titanic, and they filled it with, you know, a flammable sort of gas, and it blew up over New Jersey. The only mycelium that flammable one? It was supposed to be, like, um, the flying in luxury, flying in the sky in luxury. Yes. But then it caught on fire really fast. I can't remember if I read, like, the Dear America series when it took place up there, or... I read some book about it, though. Um, there's some photographer who's recreating pictures, like the Hindenburg disaster, um, just in a soundstage. Okay, I'm confused. He's recreating the Hindenburg disaster in a soundstage. I don't know what that means. He's, like, trying to recreate. So that picture of the blimp, like, on fire. Right. Was the 20 most recognizable images of the whatever, of all time. Um, so he's trying to, like, recreate them, I guess. I don't know. Also, it makes more sense when you see it. It's on the internet. <laughs> I'm not, like, a fine Bordeaux either, so I, I only sort of remember what I've... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, Brodigan wrote a poem, though, about it. He did. It's, yeah, it's the Hindenburg poem, and I'm flipping frantically to try to find it. While you do that... Anyway. All of my technology is quickly dying. Really? God, this, this is the saddest book club where it's just like the computers are eating us. 
Um, yeah, this this one's a, a near bust. I guess we're not going to get Ashley either, are we? No, she's on her way. So we can oh, find good. her once and for all. all. Right. This, this is, is a poem by Brodigan. I don't like uh, reading poetry aloud, but it's quick. So, your departure versus the Hindenburg. This is in honor of Casey's departure. Every time we say goodbye, I see it as an extension of the Hindenburg, that great 1937 airship exploding in medieval flames like a burning castle above New Jersey. When you leave the house, the shadow of the Hindenburg enters to take your place. That's dramatic for him, actually. Isn't he? He's dramatic. I like that about the guy. Except, well, Casey describes him as gentle. I see him as dramatic, but in a way that does not offend me. Hmm, okay. I saw him sort of as... I don't know. Like, the guy in the corner there would go, hmm. Um, but he seems sort of, like, numb to the world. Almost. Hmm. Ah, you found him numb. Yeah, like, he's just sort of, he always seems, he's absorbing a lot of information, but he doesn't seem angry about anything that comes in. He doesn't seem enthusiastic about any of the information he's absorbing. But he seems to really like Vita. They're hitting it off. Uh, he seems to think that she's really, like, aesthetically pleasing. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Does he ever say he loves her? Does he ever say it? And I, 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 I was interested to hear that when <laughs> it's like, I'm angry, therefore I exist. He didn't show enough anger, <laughs> just generally. That questions what, is he numb? Why isn't he angry? He's not angry, but like, he's not nothing. Like, or he'll say, um, I mean, he seems to just be, I don't know. Oh, how does he show upset? I think he was upset when he was seeing the coffee stain on the wing of the plane. I think he, like, escapes into his imagination when he gets upset. Yeah, okay. It's um, a good question about the love. I don't remember whether they say I love you or love ever. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, she seems to accept him, but, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you're right. You're right. You're sort of you be a better time to raise a child. What? There was a talk about how there would be a better time to raise a child. Yeah, but they didn't seem that upset. Like, even that, like, they're like, um, should we get an abortion? Yeah, I don't want to have a kid. Okay. Um, and then it sort of, it seemed almost like the stressful part for him was leaving the library. Not so much, I don't know. Here I mean, like, yeah, you're gonna, you didn't really have baby steps out of the library. It was like, here's your first time out, and it's for abortions in Tijuana. There's less attachment and more... Um, just, what's going on here? Um, crutches. Wait, what? A crutch. His library what? was a crutch. Are you saying the word crutch? Crutch. Like something you put under your arm when you break a leg. And that's the library, you think? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying their relationship. Oh, their relationship is a crutch. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it every relationship? For God's sake. I think so. I don't know. I think Ellie and think Carl really love each other. Yeah, you can love each other, but aren't isn't everybody sort of propping up everybody else? I have loved all of my crutches. Everyone. <laughs> yeah. It's not about love, Sam. You love your crutches. Oh, that's love. That's my you got to do that. All right, I have a question. Yeah. This is part of what made me think it was real, and now I'm really excited to learn more about what parts were and were not real. Like, like I said, I kind of did it on purpose. Why the three abortions? The chapter is called Three Abortions, and we sit through the person, the patient before his girlfriend and the patient after, right? Mm hmm Why the three? Um... That it made me think, God, he really sat through this because I just couldn't imagine. I guess it's it's my own failure of imagination, but as an author writing about this moment, I think I would be so myopically focused on my own little girlfriend. I wouldn't even put a lot of people in the waiting room. Okay, so, well, I think I have an answer to that, maybe. But okay. I think before my bigger question, 
So why did he write a book about an abortion if he'd never, wow. none of his girlfriends had ever had an abortion, he'd never been to Tijuana for an abortion? So why? Why? I think the whole book was very provocative, everything he was talking about. Huh? I feel like the whole thing was very provocative for the time. Yeah, I mean, abortion was illegal, right? When was Roe v. Wade? Lawyer. I uh, I forget, and I'm looking it up right now. I think this might have been written the year after Roe v. Wade. I thought Roe v. Wade was... Um, I'm some... totally wrong. Roe v. Wade is 73. Yeah, because she said that her sister got an abortion in Sacramento. No, no, but that would have been illegal. It, it wasn't legal yet. Um... So was it to make a point about, like, he's very matter-of-fact about, like, was that why? Why did he write? Uh, yeah, so, that, so was this a political work, yeah. right? It occurs to you, it must be. I mean, his position was obvious, but he, um, you know, he's for it. But he dis he demonstrated his position without arguing at all. As Casey said, he writes very gently. Yeah. Um, it seems very matter of fact. It seems. Um, but I think even the, the three abortions, just because it was sort of. I don't know. I mean, part of it because he was talking about like sort of these baby steps to get even out of the house. So I feel like he was just absorbing everything, these little bite sized nuggets. So he gets there, and so he's very focused on what's going on in the other exam room. And then it's Vita's turn, and then it's the next person's turn while he's waiting to see if Vita's going to wake up. He's concerned about Vita, so he's just kind of focusing on everything around him. Um, and then it's just, I don't know. That part of the book was sort of, it's kind of gross, I guess. Like, like it's a matter of fact, but you're just like, yeah, that doesn't sound like a fun day. Did you suffer through reading it? I was pretty riveted by that part, even though it was the least... Poetic. I don't know. I guess that's why it was interesting to me. I thought he got. You're. I think. Are you saying he was less observational? I felt like he was more observational and less poetic at that time. But. Well, definitely less poetic. I don't know. I mean, that was the only part of the book. It's weird. A book about called the abortion is actually not very much about abortions until it's only like how many pages do you think? Like fifty pages less. Um. But it was just sort of, like, this is this guy's day. Like, his day is he wakes up and he takes books from weirdos and he organizes them. And then he just has this routine. This doctor, his job is to just sort of live in this little building. And his job is to process the abortions. And it's very matter-of-fact. Um, so maybe is it supposed to be like a bookend to kind of what he does? Like, he, he works in a library for books that will never be read, and now to escape that, he's going to go to Tijuana to go to a hospital for babies that will never be born. Or maybe new relationships, people who had to, I don't know. Oh, I love that. I had not even thought to draw a parallel between the librarian and the doctor. Well done. Now that I think about mm -hmm. it, I want to like hit myself over the head, but yeah, excellent. But you can also do that with the hotel and with the funeral home and all of his other observations, all these people just doing their jobs. Yeah. The bartender, the waitress. We're all just a brick in the wall. Uh, so I take it, were you guys not uplifted by this book? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I sort of thought he was like sort of amusing and really sweet and I wanted to be his friend. But, especially after I read his Wikipedia page, and I was like, oh, he killed himself while just sort of, like, looking out the window, and then he just shot himself, and, and then he died, and they didn't find his body for a while. Like, it's just like, everything he does is just kind of like, mm, all right, now I'm going to do this. I don't know. I wasn't uh, up. So do you was worry sort of about that? Like, do you not like to look at Van Gogh's paintings because of the whole, you know, ear thing and the suicide? No. I don't know. Well, a painting's also different, because I think, or at least, for, like, if you look at Van Gogh, it's almost it's like a lot of emotion, I think. Yeah. For this guy, it's just kind of, like, no emotion. Like, everything's just very, like... Cut and dry. What, what did you say, Sam? Cut and dry. 
yeah, it's just kind of like, this happened and that happened, and then, like, he says stuff, and it's amusing, but then you just kind of feel, I don't know. Like, really? The- I read him so differently, but I'm very interested. I probably, I don't know. I feel like Ronigan, I do this with people occasionally in life. I haven't done it recently, but I'll just, like, pick someone and decide that I love this person. And I, I- just pay attention to every detail and I feel like I've done that with Brodigan as an author. Okay. Like you on my page on my page twelve, I'm already writing in the margins, like, ha, see, that's how you slip poetry into a novel. You know, like I've got like check marks and yes all over my margins. Because of so what I'm saying is I don't I don't see him as just registering observations. I do see him as writing lyric and experiencing moments very deeply in a way that I myself am not really capable of always experiencing moments and recording that as a poet, kind of as a photographer in yeah. the, in a beautiful world that I don't live in. Yeah, and we sort of talked about that before, not in one of these Google chats, but about how he's kind of like the Christopher Isherwood, a camera with his shutter open. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But... It's not that you're right. I like everything's very lyrical and but it's almost like there are so many details he's registering. It has to be overwhelming for him. Or like that's why it has no um sort of emotion behind it. Or I wasn't reading a lot of emotion and it just seemed like he absorbs so many details and processes so much that like leaving that library is really overwhelming for him. And so he's gonna write everything that he's noticed, um, but that that's kind of exhausting for him. I don't know. I felt bad for him. Okay, yeah. I can totally see him. Yeah, I can see him being on overload. He does seem on emotional overload to me, for sure. I see, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and he hit points of numbness. I see that, too. Look, my favorite part, and I kind of want to – I like he goes to a restaurant – and um, some people don't tip the waitress because they don't tip her enough or something. And he says, she stared at the tipless table as if it were a sex criminal. Ash- <laughs> <laughs> I wrote down, I think I've done that before. That's me. <laughs> you what? I wrote down in the margin, I think I've done that before too. Stared at a table like it was, a- I've done that for sure. Yeah, for sure. In my way to say comparing those people to sex criminals. People that, <laughs> I think that's fun. I want to start using that phrase, sex maniac. We need to bring that back. You're sex maniac. Ashley, what did you think of this book? Because we were speculating. I said I didn't think you liked it very much. I didn't dislike it. I just Ashley, didn't... you're here. I'm here. I'm <clears throat> sorry I'm late. No, no, not to worry. I look forward to you trashing this author because I'm trying to no. uh, d- defend him. I don't know that I would trash him. I just didn't feel like it went anywhere. Like, I just kept waiting for, I don't know, something to happen. And I, I don't know if I was supposed to. I just... Okay. It just... It was a few days in their lives. That was it. Yes. I, uh, we were talking a bit earlier about... Um, like I mentioned this is not a plot-driven book. That's for sure. So if you're reading it and looking for plot points, you're not going to find it. I mean, but I also, I didn't just like reading it. It was, you know, perfectly enjoyable. I just, I don't know, I wanted to feel something for any of the characters. And the only one that I really did was, um, no, the, actually the other guy, the guy. Yeah. What's his name? Foster. Told you he's not very like. Oh, Foster? Was he the most likable, the cave guy? Yeah. Yeah. The guy that threw the old lady out for bringing in a book of nothing? Yeah, I liked him. He had personality. You liked him because he was efficient. (laughs) Probably. What is this book of no no words? Get out of here. Wait, where's Casey? Uh, She had to leave. I have to refresh my drink. I'll be right back. Okay, let's get back to the book. Um, Um... Yeah, I mean, I don't think, 
I agree with the observation stated earlier that this book isn't really that much about an abortion considering it's called the abortion. I don't get and that's not the most memorable thing to me. The most memorable thing is the library. And I am semi-obsessed right now with Cindy's suggestion that we should draw a parallel between the librarian, Brodigan, and the abortion doctor. But then, if you're going to labor, like, belabor that parallel a little bit, is an unread book. So these aren't unwritten books, right? They've been written. But it doesn't appear that anyone ever reads them, including Brodigan, the librarian himself. So yeah. is an unread book equal to an aborted life? Um, you know, I'm thinking of book in different stages. A book that's been conceived, a book that's been written, and a book that's been read, and a book that's been widely distributed. Yes. Is it a great loss not to get to read that one that had no words in it? <laughs> that that person brought in, like, is that even a book or <laughs> what is? Oh that? yeah, yeah. Um, but again, they they, I don't know. They thought it worthy of bringing here for collection, so it must have been. Maybe it's just the process of bringing a book in. It's just like the journey of the people that bring them. It's less about what they wrote and more about. Yeah, like they had to finish something and bring it in and get rid of it so that they could move on to the next part of their life. And that's sort of what, you know, Prodigan does. He goes on this journey um, to Tijuana, and while he's there, he and Vida sort of shed something. He's not allowed to work at the library anymore when he gets back. Um, I don't know. And so now they... I love it. I so <laughs> didn't read it that way, but I love it. I'm going to continue to think about it. And he, yeah, and so Brodigan's role is to non judgmentally, like, I'm looking for it and I can't find it, but he states his purpose in this book once or twice. He says, like, my purpose is this. And it's, as I recall, it's to sort of non judgmentally accept all of the people who deliver their works. And that's mm -hmm. definitely the posture of the abortion doctor, too. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I thought as much about it. I probably should have, but I found it to be very bizarre that. There's this library, and yet nobody reads these books. Like, because he seems to take it very seriously, and this is a very important thing, but it's, it is. It's only about the authors. It's not about anything put in the pages. And yeah, that's the, true. The authors are described. The, the books themselves aren't. He also has a very unpleasant opinion of the San Francisco airport. And I know that that is Ashley's favorite airport because they sell sandwiches there that are very good. And at the time, I don't know if that restaurant existed back then. <laughs> I think maybe it has gotten. He just like the San Francisco he he like Sacramento. He just likes Sacramento. He liked the San Francisco airport. I thought he said the San Francisco airport. No, the San Francisco one. He felt like um, he needed to be dressed in tuxedo to use the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah, but was that? A positive yes. expression? Because okay. when he gets back, he again comments on the... Or the San Diego airport is when he doesn't. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, For a man who's never flown on an airplane. Uh, let's see. One of my favorite things that he does is... Uh, did you guys happen to notice his references to, like, dinosaurs? Dinosaur is a simile or a metaphor he'll go to often, or he'll say, like, a turkey. He'll reference these often animals or just animals and objects that kids kind of learn, you know, before they turn five or six, and they often form the, the basis of some of his imagery and his metaphors throughout, and I love that he does that. Because he combines, um, for, I think he combines sophistication with those kind of primal images so that you don't get totally lost in abstraction. I think he grounds things in, um, yeah, sensuality and images that everybody can understand. Um, what, were, wait, what was the dinosaur part? Well, see, I'm sorry, my page numbers are different. On my page, like, he mentions dinosaurs in uh, four or five different metaphors in this book. And I just know that because he does it in his poetry, too. So it was kind of a theme that I, it's a theme that I watch in his writing. But on page 57, he has a line, 
he talks about the dinosaurs of her own choosing. And it's, you know, of course it's not a literal thing. He's using a dinosaur, I think, to re refer to, um, let's see. We live most of our lives privately under our clothes, except in a case like Vida, whose body lived outside of herself like a lost continent, complete with dinosaurs of her own choosing. Okay, so no, there he's like really just, you know, giving you that prehistoric image of the Earth, a continent yeah. being roamed by dinosaurs. You know, like kids read books about that, and he's using that children's book image to help explain to us how she feels. I love that he does things like that. She's speaking to something primal. Or just, like I said, I cannot, I don't know if it's primal to think of dinosaurs, but it's like, it reminds me of kids' books. It reminds me of coloring books and like young, you know, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten science education books. Does he talk about dinosaurs a lot in his book? You, you say in other books he brings up dinosaurs, or just here? Yeah, dinosaurs, you know, like all poets will have a theme. Some poets have a theme of yellow. Like Bro one of Brodigan's main themes is, um, well, I would, I'm sorry, I would not say it's a main theme, but it's a leitmotif that I've detected. Dinosaurs, you'll find that word or that reference in a lot of his poetry. Okay. That's interesting. Uh I wonder what tell him about Baudelaire. I sent Baudelaire that uh, I sent you guys. He's Baudelaire sitting on the steps of a library with a wino, and the wino says, "You know, I'm a million years old, and I can remember dinosaurs." And Baudelaire responds, "Be you drunken ceaselessly." Oh. But like he'll just he'll throw that out there. So dinosaurs were a simpler time. I, what is it? It's, it's ancient, it's exotic, it's uh, concrete, you it really gives you an image. Ah. I thought we trying to bury a bone under me while we talked to you. Um, Our lighting is not as good as theirs. It's daytime where Greer is. No, it's not. <laughs> it looks so bright in there, it's not? I was just assuming that it's natural light. What? No, no, it's... Uh, I just, I have, um, overhead lighting bothers me, so I have a lot of lamps in my house. I, I always do. Thank you. Did you come up when you started talking about dinosaurs? Well, like, okay, see, I, I've made another list. On my page 96, these descriptions, buffalo heavy blonde hair. Uh -huh. So, buffalo hair isn't blonde, but like when he says the word buffalo, don't you see an image of a buffalo? There's nothing abstract about this. You see a children's book kind of thing or yeah. a science book kind of thing, and you get that scratchiness. So buffalo heavy blonde hair, or just shortly thereafter, he says somebody took a turkey slug of a drink. What the hell is a turkey slug of a drink? But from the sound of those words, I get a sense of what kind of slug that was. What does buffalo blonde hair mean? Like the texture of a buffalo or like buffalo to bully? She has bully hair. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. To me, buffalo hair sounds scratchy and full. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that was Foster's hair. I'm not sure. Let me see. I'll look it up. Well, then it could be in all sense of the word. Everything. Um, I'm trying to think of what other part. Yeah, that was Foster's hair. He had buffalo heavy blonde hair. And I think Foster, yeah, Foster gobbled down a big turkey slug of whiskey. He's like a crude animal, that Foster. Well, a buffalo is a heavy hand, so I think it just means it's a very heavy hand. What did you say, Ashley? I just said that a buffalo is a heavy animal. So in the context of buffalo heavy, it's just to say he has a very thick head of hair. Yeah. Very Heavy and he's like a bull in a china shop kind of guy too, generally. So, um, well, I like, highlighted this part. I like this. It was so strange to be among people again. I'd forgotten how complex they were in large units. Um, <laughs> everything sort of. So maybe that's like the three abortions. Like it's simple if you just have three. Like that's a small number. You can digest that. Uh, well, later. Okay, so earlier. 
Sorry, Ashley, you came in late. So what you don't know is that Grudick said by three abortions. She asked that earlier. Why were they three? Um, and then he has all the like numbers seem to be a thing with him. Yeah, and we were talking about um, well, I, is the, did this really happen to Brodigan? Was this like to what extent was this real life experience for him? And I said that the three thing made me think, God, he seemed like he was really there. Like this, he really was present for something like this, but apparently maybe not. Yeah. I mean, all I thought about with the three abortions, it, it, it was a way of making it not personal, which was, again, I think the theme of the book, nothing of it really felt incredibly personal, but we went That's into... That's interesting. I, think, I do think that everything is personal for him. Like, I think everything feels personal. You know, I don't feel that it goes to the... Of their, well, it doesn't delve into how he feels about things. It's just more like a surface level. This happened. This person came in. We ate these foods. We drank this. We fucked. We whatever. You know, like we did these things. But it doesn't ever delve into how he feels. Or so we were talking about this a little bit before. Um, yeah, we were. I think it's because probably he is depressed, or there's some like. He seems to get overwhelmed, and so he just sort of deals with things into tiny details. Um, but that that doesn't mean it's not personal for him. It just means it comes across as having no... Um, I don't mean it's not personal for him. I mean it's not personal for him. I see. Like, I don't get to know this person well, because he's not letting me into his psyche. He's just giving me the facts to do with what I want to do. Um, he may have all sorts of analysis of, the, of what these things mean to him. But in terms of the three abortions, again, the one was hers, so that's a very personal thing or a very... I think this also ties into our question about did the two of them ever say, I love you, or did the word love appear? And so now I'm extra interested in the question because... It's really becoming clear to me. He, I think Brodigan does not express love by using the word love. I no. think he expresses it by describing lots of other things. Like his way of loving things is to notice the details and to mention them. He really or, loves the uh, coffee stain on the Lena Bear plane. Yes. He loves that. He seems to love that. Um, and he seems to like, I mean... He talks about Vita's hair in this way, where, like, he seems just really transfixed by her. Um, I have a, another question to just veer off a little bit. Yeah. Um, okay, so Vita is the most beautiful woman in the world, and she's getting an abortion. Is that important for any reason? Like, he keeps talking about how beautiful she is. Now she's getting an abortion. I mean, it's almost even like that. Like, because beautiful thing, she's not, she's like a piece of art or something. But she's actually, I don't know. What do we think that meant? Um, I think that abortions should be legal because pretty girls get them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you're an abortion that lives. That's nice. Hi. Oh, David. I was wondering who was dancing there. How are you, honey? I haven't seen you in a long time. Hi, sweetie. Ow. And by, th this is something that did bother me. It's probably the first time Brodigan that ha has ever bothered me. I really felt like he he felt like he had too much to do with her getting comfortable with herself. I didn't like that. It bugged me. He thought that he had made her more comfortable? Yes. I felt he thought he played too much of a role in that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know... And so I don't know. That's why my my little feminist feathers were getting ruffled about that whole thing. But um, maybe that I don't. Well, I yeah. also felt that way, and yet he continued to objectify her. And I didn't know if that was intentional or not. But like when talking about her body, he seems to be this man who can see through her soul instead of just physical whatever. Supposedly, except he continues to comment on the fact that she still has a flat stomach. So not to worry, he finds it attractive. Or I don't. Did he say not to worry? I find that attractive. Well, no, but he continued to comment <laughs> he just on said. that. But her, her stomach is still black and beautiful. Like there was a reference to beauty in the fact that it, she wasn't showing. Well, 
I think that maybe it was almost like they were both in on this. Okay, so, and also at the end that she becomes a topless dancer or whatever. I thought it was like they were sharing this big joke with the world. Like, ha, 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 this is what you don't know. You're sitting here worshipping this person who you think is so beautiful and perfect just because of an exterior thing. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to get an abortion. That hilarious with that, like, we're really going to play with your expectations there. Um, oh, I see. Do you think the world thinks that pretty girls don't get abortions? Yeah, I mean, I think the world is very taken with the appearances, and so you look at Vida, and I think that people were quick to sort of say that she had certain uh, qualities or, I don't know, I mean attributes that maybe she has no claim to. Where does the world get that um, beautiful women don't have abortion? I don't think I've ever thought about it. Whether, no. like, I have a, a stereotype. I don't think I do. I think it was maybe just more, like, almost kind of fun <laughs> in a way. Like, okay, so you think I'm so beautiful. Well, I don't know. I guess I was shocked by her getting an abortion because... I imagine she was a woman because of how she see how the world sees her, or whatever. That wasn't very sexually experienced, or like who hides from her own beauty. And then did they say that that she was? Well, no, but that's what I took from it. You know. She didn't seem to be a very active participant in the bedroom, but it just kind of also because she was just like, eh, it's not even my body. Oh, was she lame in bed? Was she a starfish? I didn't pick up on that. Well, she was a starfish for sure. But yeah, when she first gets undressed, like he has to do it for her or whatever. So this, to me, meant this was a woman that hasn't had a lot of sex. She's very. I didn't take it that way. I took it to be she's always just very matter of fact by this about this. She's always just like whatever. This isn't even my body. Yet. Who was it who said that about Angelina Jolie? She just lies there. I think it was Billy Bob. Yeah. Well, who? I think that's sort of a stereotype, isn't it? That attractive people just don't do anything. <laughs> like you know, they don't have to try. So. Well. Yeah, I don't know. It might be founded, in fact, but yeah, I think that that's a stereotype. Um, um, what an abstract thing it is to take your clothes off in front of a stranger for the very first time. It isn't really what we planned on doing. Your body almost looks away from itself and is a stranger to this world. We live most of our lives privately under our clothes, except in a case like Vida, whose body lived outside of herself like a lost continent. With dinosaurs of her own choosing, I'll turn the lights out, she said, sitting next to me on the bed. I was startled to hear the panic. She seemed almost relaxed a few seconds before. Why, how fast? But she hates her body. Right. Um, yeah, she said that's a good idea. It will be very hard. But I have no other choice. I can't go on like this forever. But this, to me, sounds like a woman who doesn't get undressed in front of her often. It's this uncomfortable letting a man take her clothing off. So, oh, okay. Was this their first night? Was, did they sleep together on the first night they met each other? Yes. Yeah. But if, like, I mean, if she's going to say, this will be very hard, but I have no other choice, I would imagine it's been a very long time since she tried this getting undressed in front of a person before. Just from how that. did I read that? I think I read that differently. Um, I'm trying to remember how I read that too. I do remember it. Like, so I I continue to struggle with. She just didn't feel like her. The whole theme is she she didn't feel like her insides matched her outsides. Right. That was the thing. Like she didn't feel like internally she matched her beautiful exterior, and that's why she was uncomfortable with it. Yeah. I mean, I started this book off almost reading it like transgender, like, of like, If you get hung up on everybody else's hang-ups, then the whole world's going to be nothing more than a huge gallows. We kiss. See, yeah. I like that. Like, I like that. I think that maybe is the theme of, like, the abortion, too. Other people might get hung up on it, but not that's their thing. It's just sort of the right choice for them. I don't know. Yeah, that's good. My whole take on the blasé abortion thing was that, to me, was the political message of this book. It shouldn't be a big deal. Yeah, I think right there, yeah. 
you know, it was kind of part of their early relationship, and it's kind of too bad that they had to go down to Tijuana, you know, it's like, it maybe should be next door, but here is the interesting little weekend trip that they took as a result, but really, not a big deal. Yeah, I like the part, it's like in a cab or something, and they go, how did you enjoy Tijuana? And he's like, oh, why were you here? And he's like, oh, because you had abortion. And then after, I was like, ha, 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 such a kidder. <laughs> did, <laughs> did you get a kick out of the description of, like, I don't know, I think she was too young to be a sorority girl, but I got her to be, I took her to be, like, a sort of valley girl, sorority girl type whose parents brought her to Tijuana. That cracked me up. I thought that was hilarious. I took her as a high school student. Wait, who? The one of the, the three ab abortions. I thought the one was, like, a girl, like, a yes. young girl. It was, like, a high school girl or something. Rich parents. She was 16. Like her parents were, you know, I don't know, you know, snobby sorts of parents, and she didn't, <laughs> she didn't handle the anesthesia very well. Like that cracked me up. I love that whole scene. Oh, you thought that was funny? I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, didn't she like she was acting drunk after her abortion because she wasn't handling the drugs very well, and her parents were, you know, triply mortified. It's great. She was being what? Rude in her abortion. I think she was. She seemed wasted after her abortion. It's like you have to bring your daughter to Mexico. She has an abortion, and now she's acting wasted. Oh my pearls! Oh, pearl clutching. Um, yeah, wait, I'm there now. But I think that was the purpose of the three abortions was just to show how bad matter of fact it is. Yeah, you get to this place for a hundred. That was a day. And then it's always the same, and then the doctor has his lunch. And... I was fine with the abortion. I was actually, I, I think maybe, there, there, I wasn't bored by it. I think Santa is reawakening. I'll be right back, y'all. All right, I had to blow my nose. I'm a really loud nose blower, and I just, I didn't want it recorded, so my apologies. <laughs> no, I was screaming to Sam to see if she was there, but I don't think she's back yet. Oh, I want Sam to be back. Well, you guys, uh, let me see. I miss, I, I'm sure I missed something. I did have a question. What did you think about the librarian at the end who took over his job? I was deeply distressed by this. He had, oh, he had to go now. Uh, yeah, I, felt, I, I didn't like poor guy. Um, and she even says you have to be a normal person now. Um, I mean, I'm glad he was leaving the library, but I think the position was taken over from Foster while he was gone by a very brusque woman. Yeah. And, you know... And that would be as bad as having an abortion doctor with a bad bedside manner, I suppose. Well, yes. Well, okay, so it was sort of, I mean, it made me sad because he invested so many years. Like, at the beginning, he says that he's sort of made for this job, that no one has ever been better at this job than he is right now at this moment. Do you know everybody else? Oh, they might have. I think that, yeah, I think you're right. Like, uh, but then she comes, and she's sort of, the librarian comes, and she Sort of felt terrible job. How could, what kind of place are you running? You let this guy take over for you. That's some bad character. Get out of my library. Um, it's like not being appreciated for the time you put in, and then just getting sort of cast aside. And uh, like that was a very meaningful part of his life. Then now it's over. It's almost like a little death. I guess start. He's like reborn and start a new life. Uh, like, well, I was worried primarily about the people who are going going to come to the library after that and how they're going to be received. Oh, I think she would she would receive them fine. I think she was disgusted that he chose Foster to. Oh, I see. You saw it as a harsh rebu rebuke and not a reflection of her true personality. Yeah, I think she. I, I think she had the wrong idea. He was the best librarian that had ever existed, but she only saw like literally the two days that he was gone and he left Foster with the library, and she took that to be a sign that this whole time he's just been a disaster and hasn't been doing it. I see. Okay, okay. And that, I don't know, I just thought it was really 
Ashley, I've got to apologize. I have a cold, and I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, I'm sorry. I can speak up. Uh, so I think that's true. Uh, I mean, I think we're supposed to read the whole book as various forms of abortion and not just... Yeah, everything's an abortion. Until you're ready for it. You just keep avoiding things in your life until it's time. So. Everything is an abortion. I mean, I, like I said, Cindy, I'm, I'm, in, I'm just am simultaneously punishing myself for not having realized the parallel you're drawing, and I'm loving it, but I'm not fully accepting it yet. I'm not sure that I may the arrival at that. So I don't understand what fault you're finding. It. It's not that I'm finding a fault. It's that um, I'm not sure that it's an analogy or a parallel. To me, it might be um, a converse or an inverse situation. Like, what I mean is, you know, dropping that book off at the library is not equal to an abortion. To me, it might be the opposite of an abortion, you know, it might be a, a mirror image of the abortion, although, of course, I understand the parallels, of course. I think it's the title of the book. And, Counting towards and I don't think it's about the fact that they went to Tijuana and had an abortion. I think that the bigger symbolism for the entire thing is correct in that, in these words. that page where they describe, like, the the 20 people or the 30 people who come in in the books that had come in that? Yes, that's my favorite chapter. We were talking about it earlier. I think that it's called The 23. I think the whole... I mean, the word abortion is supposed to be more symbolic. Well, and here's what you've got. So, actually, in the book, it's divided into books. So, book two is Vida. That's Vida. And then they count towards Tijuana. Book three, call the phase. How did he structure this? Sort of. Oh, there was a chapter on masturbation. Why was that important? There is? Yes. It's called masturbation. <laughs> um, How I missed it? That's impossible to explain. Okay, let me find it. Until she just turned to it, I had forgotten that that existed. I'm <laughs> uh, With the Carlo Blade Jr. brought in a book called The Other Side of My Hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, don't you just love him? I hope you guys love him. I really do. I just, but I understand if you don't. I'm not sure if this had been the first thing I'd read by Brodigan. I'm not sure if I would love him. I, I no, so you like the poems you sent too. I like those. But, Sydney, you told me, do you remember when I was in D.C. in the summer of 2012 and you would say things like, Greer's trying to make me read a poem again? That was the book I was trying to make you read. I know, I know. I remember, I, actually, I, enjoy, I enjoy his poems because I like flowers for the one you love. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. One can get BD. The doctor, if you think you have it, and so will those you love. And so will the ones you love. Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, he's just funny. Like, I love his uh, I feel awful she doesn't, you know, I feel awful she doesn't love me. And then he goes on to describe a, a disgusting image. But it's such a great inverse love poem. I'm getting Sam's screen on my computer again. Is Sam making noise back there? Sam? Sam, are you getting Sam. What? Oh, wait, she's there. Are you calling? Yeah, Sorry, Sam, you're back. No, I'm declogging a sink. Good. Sam, can you postpone that for five minutes? Sam, I come back to the book club. Declog the sink in a second. Seriously. Huh? By you guys, I just mean you. I think everyone else is taking I came in to shower, and my sink is just driving me crazy. This is how I prepare for jobs. Land the fire in the water. Sam, are we on the toilet? Oh, 
you are on the toilet. They get the abortion, and he calls Tijuana the land of fire and water because it's all a bunch of flushing toilets, and they're flushing the abortions, and a lot of fire for sterilizing. But fire and water is supposed to be symbols of uh, rebirth, right? And I'm forgetting all of my, my English majors. Sydney, why did you just throw your book down and cross your arms? I don't know. It's all it's all like the authors just write books, kind of like the books that are never going to be read, and then just let people decide, make them much more deeper than they actually ever were. You think the books are deep because they've never been read? I really want to read Growing Flowers. No, I mean, you think authors just write books because they want to write a book about a topic, and then their audience just makes them deeper than they actually were. So maybe this isn't deep at all. I don't know. Structure. Yeah, I can't use, like, but I'm talking to a bunch of English majors right now, and that's going to upset all of you. No, I think definitely people read into things that aren't necessarily there. I read very deeply into things that don't matter at all, and I'm proud of it. Yeah. I wasn't criticizing the readers. I'm just saying I think authors sometimes get more credit than they deserve. I mean, I was kidding with the last thing I said. Yeah, no, that's true. I guess I'm still... So, so, yeah, to me, a book that never gets read... I mean, of course, like, my brain goes to that cliched paradox of a tree falling in a forest when no one is around. But to me, a book that's not read is not parallel to a fetus that's aborted because I think the writing of the book is a big part of the book. Well, I think okay, that... Okay, so here's, here's my new parallel... I think, okay, so it's the journey to writing the book is more important than the book itself. It's like the people writing that book, finishing it, and bringing it to the library and then telling the library the story is the important part. Just as going to get the abortion was the important part of the against. That journey down to Tijuana was really just the, the emphasis for him starting his life, moving on to the next chapter. So in that way, abortion is parallel to what he was doing. Huh. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's not exclusively the, yeah, the important part, but yeah, I guess that's, and then we read the story about the abortion just as we, if it, so the abortion in that way lives on. I'm sorry, my dog's barking next to me. So, yeah, if, although the life was aborted, although the story wasn't read, that story carries on. It's going to have an influence because you'll at least read a story about that story. And in that way, the aborted story also has life. Yeah. It's more like, yeah. So it's, it's like, the, the whole thing. Like, when you talk to someone you don't know on the street, what are you doing? I mean, so inside that person is a bunch of stories you're never going to read, but they're influencing, I think, your interaction with that person, always. Yeah. Right? That person is a repository of... I don't know, abortions is so strong, but unread works is not. And those are all playing into how you're talking to that human. Yeah. Um, yeah, so all of their stories, whether you know each individual story, will make up whether or not you like that person when you're interacting with them. Um, yeah, how many abortions have you had? The more you have, the more I like you. <laughs> you fit on Perhaps. Um, <laughs> well, this is also sort of, it's maybe he's playing around with the abortion is the thing that finally gives him life. Like, he's been, so at the end, and I'm like, on the second to last page, or third to last page, he talks about how Vita puts on a Beatles album, and he had never heard the Beatles before. That's how long I was in the library. So he was sort of in this, like, tomb, and getting an abortion was what got out of it. I was trying, that caused me to do math. Because I was like, wait, he was only in there like three or three and a half years. What were the, because, well, it was right here, 1966. When did the Beatles come out? When did the Beatles come out for Okay, I'm looking it up right now, and I remember what you guys are talking about. Okay, so yes, this album, Rubber Soul, forgive me, like, my history of music knowledge is pathetic, but have you heard of that album? Yes. I did not know that album. Beatles, Rubber Soul. I don't know. 
Sam. Sam. Here. Yeah. What are you What are you doing? Can you wash my face? Well, you have to talk to me about this book. Okay, Rubber Soul is 1965. Okay. That's when it came out. I mean, she's working in the chocolate place. So that means she's really, like, she's just kind of. Oh yeah, what it, you mentioned it before, Cindy. But what did you think about that? That actually bummed me out. I did not like that. I think he's trying to make points at the end. She's all hung up on her body. She's trying. She doesn't know what to do with it. And so at the end, by the end of the book, she's like, whatever. Let's just. I'm in. This is the body I have. Let's work with it. Oh, um, you thought this was a show of comfort? Yes. Yeah. I did too. Oh really? Gosh, I didn't take that from that at all. There's a scene. I mean, the first scene where she, again, I read part of it, but where she's getting undressed in front of him, and she says, I have to do this, it's going to be hard, but... She wants the lights off, she doesn't want to be here. Now she's working in a topless bar. It's like, it's literally working. Like, oh, okay. That is not how I took it. Um, I felt like that was moving from one state of desperation to another. Uh, yeah, I think you're hurt. Well, and I think maybe, okay, so it's, this is, I don't know, I think if you take the whole book as a bunch of symbols, like maybe in real life, that would be more to it. But I think that I took everything as sort of like these little strings he was tying up. So for instance, like when he says that, or sort of he implies that through him she's gaining confidence, I didn't see that as anti-feminist as much as I saw it as, She's like he is just sort of a chapter in her life too. And soon she'll leave him. Like he left me like it. She needs him now, but then she won't a little bit. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, I can take that. I mean, I'm kind of making fun of myself when I say that that ruffled my feathers. I don't think it necessarily should. I think we gain confidence and self love through lots of sorts of relationships. I don't think there's any problem with gaining confidence or acceptance of yourself through a romantic relationship, you know, that's fine, but I don't know, just occasionally I felt like he was kind of tooting his own horn about it. Yeah. But I also think he took those descriptions, Sydney and I, you, you and I talked about it on the phone, like, I, I really think that his descriptions of her effect on men out in the real world were intentionally absurd, completely, like... <laughs> People just, like, literally dying because she's so beautiful. People don't, you know what happens to me? People just die every time they look at you. Actually. They just Not fall down, time. like, car accidents happen. Like, people get sick. It was, like, it, I felt it was intentionally absurd. I, I, think, I also like that he kept just saying that, like, Vida was doing her thing. And he's so, like, I don't know. Oh, yeah, he called it her thing. Oh, right, exactly. So after he gave us enough images, he stopped and he started to say, and so she was doing her thing again, and then we got lunch. The one thing that sort of, he, starts, he implies that all the other beautiful women are really jealous of Vida, and that sort of felt Oh, uh, yeah. I never felt that way. I never felt like I see somebody that's really beautiful, and I think, God, I hate you, you beautiful person. Um, uh, I have never done that either, but I know that girls do. Okay. How dare you? Um, I mean, I won't lie. Like, if I were given the opportunity to walk around Earth as Angelina Jolie for a day, I would no, certainly take. Why? It. I hate her so much. Wait, Ashley but said she's jealous of beautiful women. Not strangers. Other, other beautiful women. I think it has more to do with like. Their personalities, or what? Like if I their confidence with themselves, or flaunting it, or whatever. I don't know if it's jealousy. Yeah, but to I glare do, at them and you I throw, do throw their omelet at them. Well, no, I don't do that. I don't but that like Shannon believing that she is. I mean, she's a person that I know, but. No, I'm always very aware that we're recording, as you say. Who is watching these things? I don't know, but it's live on YouTube, and I can tell you this: that I once posted a student film that was two minutes long and it was to see sound. And it was called Squatters Rights and it was just my friend Leo sitting in a store. 
uh, collecting stuff, and a bunch of people watched it and posted that I deserve to burn in hell because of my <laughs> I'm just worried that somebody's like, I'm going to be a portion and get this and be like, oh, I'm going to kill them. I'm going to find. Silly, I'm going to start writing that on everything you post now, from now on. You deserve to burn in hell. Abortion? I fell off. What just happened? Oh. Sam yeah. is making noise. They said what happened. I will be quiet. <laughs> Sam. <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you doing Tell today? Off the well, it, okay, my computer fell. Sorry to inconvenience you, Sam. Not searching things. Um. All right. Do you have any other questions, Greer? Anything? No, I don't. I just, I, I hope everybody liked it, and I'm sorry that the, you know. It didn't wind up really that pretty. pretty. I kept looking in the front of the book, too, and be like, really? <laughs> no, don't take this the wrong way. That's because what I, I said. Greer, I know you think of uh, your celebrity lookalike as Robert Duvall. Yes, yes, I do. That's true. I don't think you look like Brodigan, but you certainly make that face. <laughs> Oh my God, Jesus Christ, Sydney! Like, if your mission is to single-handedly topple my self-esteem, you are doing very well. Where you are so pretty. What are you? <laughs> Jesus Christ! I make this face. Listen, I love Brodigan, but I don't want to look like him. You don't look like him at all, but you make that face. <laughs> Listen, okay, I, you know, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go put my lipstick on and give my uh, my best Robert Duvall impression right now. Um, I feel a kinship with Brodigan. I have like Sam was making fun earlier of English majors, right? So who all was an English major? I basically was. All of us. Yes. Not, Not Sam. me. Sam, what did you major in? Education. Okay. That's right, education. And then Casey was an anthropology major, and then she went on to get her business degree. Um, so I know English majors can be annoying, and I guess you guys do too since you were all with them, but like, I'm not the kind of person who speaks romantically about how much I enjoy just reading forever in the rain. Like, Reading is actually not that pleasant an activity to me. I love talking about books, but I don't really like reading as an activity. And I don't feel like I know authors ever. That's not a common experience for me, with the exception of Brodigan and Gertrude Stein. And I do feel like I know them. And now that I'm looking at his face, okay, fine, I do make that fucking face. You make You're right. As I saw this book and I was like, he, he looks like he's just like amused by everything. That's kind of it. Not bad. He's just like, <laughs> <laughs> I find it like he's up to something. Interesting. They look like co conspirators, which is sort of fun. He's still like, he's still like, he's a book for 1966 or 1971 or whatever. If you were in a bookstore and this were a book they were selling to, I think it's interesting that on the front cover they describe it as this novel is about the romantic possibilities of a public library in California. Like, ah. That is the description that I would use to sell this book. You're um, right. Hey, thanks for yeah, thanks for pointing it out. So what? Did, how do you take that? Well, okay. So everybody comes into this library and they have a title for their book and they have to tell them what it's about for his ledger. So, like for instance, you bring in a book called The Other Side of My Hand, and they go, "Okay, what's that book about?" And you say, "Masturbation." No, it's my left hand. Oh, my left hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I told you that's the one I want to read. We'll submit this to the library of books that will never be read, um, which is fine. That means it's a secret. The abortion and historical romance. This novel is about the romantic possibilities. It's very meta. Of this place, where no one will read this. But is that what that book is about? Yeah, I mean, all the romance happened in the library. 
Um, you want to know how I took this? Okay. Uh, thanks for calling my attention to it again because I, I don't know if I saw it actually in the first place. To me, that's a sarcastic subcaption, yes. meaning uh, imagine all the great and wonderful things that can happen if you educate yourself. To me, that's what I'm saying is to me, that's part of the political statement of this book. Yeah, it's, it is so funny. So that's, it says it right on the cover. The abortion. And you go, oh, that, that book's about an abortion. No, it's not. I say right here, this novel is about the romantic possibilities of a public library. Why are you assuming it's about an abortion? Just because it's called The Abortion? I thought it was a I mean, I think that I wish that I had been, if anybody had questioned while I got to, while I was reading this on the Metro, if they had said, why are you reading a books about abortions? I would have said, I'm reading about romantic possibilities of a public library. Ah, I see. Okay, that's a great reading, too. Yeah. I would be less embarrassed to read this book. Do you like her boots, by the way? I do think her boots are very cute. I know we were talking about whether she's that cute, but I like her boots. I guess. I like her coat. I like her boots. I think she's naked under that coat, isn't she? She's what? Is she naked, naked under there? this coat? Yeah. I think she was wearing a mini skirt or whatever the fashion was. I mean, that's pretty much the outfit people describe the first time he has sex with her. Yeah. She's pretty. She's not, like, the most beautiful woman. Like, she is pretty, though. And there's nothing, well, and it's not even her face that he describes as the most beautiful. It's this rockin' body that... She's not naked. You can see a sleeve. She has a sleeve on. Kind of wearing pants. She's wearing a sweater. Yeah, I know. I think, Cindy, I forget if I responded on the thread or, like, when we were talking on the phone, but it did not occur to me to question whether she was or was not as beautiful as he claimed. I just felt like that was one of the facts in the book. That was a premise. That was just something we accept. Yeah. But so then, yeah, that, that you know, raises the question, why would he put an actual picture of her on the front? Yeah. I think he's bragging. I think that little knowing look he's giving us, it, it does kind of look like, haha, I hit that. <laughs> yeah. I smashed that to use. <laughs> <laughs> to use our friend's term. Or, okay. So we're going to do the Paris wife next, right? We decided to do it, I think, in the last week of May. Is that right? How would you guys feel about everybody has to ask, like, I don't care if it's on a thread or if you just come to the conversation with it, but everybody has to, like, come prepared with one question and her own answer to that question, but... My problem is that was, like, school, and I feel pressured to come up with some kind of question that may not even be a question I care about, but as I start talking, then it's like, oh, I did have this question, and I had that question. You want us to do the work for you. You're like Vida in the bedroom. Well, no, I just think... <laughs> up organically or feel more interesting than the ones that I come up with just so I can not sound pretentious and smart to be for him. I'm not saying that's what you guys do. I'm saying that's what I would do. With that is, Ashley, that is absolutely what I try to do. Don't worry. That is what I try to do. But no, I, I understand. Um, often I feel like I am more valuable at the end of a discussion for some reason, depending on the class that I'm in. Like, I like to... But do you like us... In order to start the discussion, like it's, this is so that we can have a more well-rounded beginning of the discussion. I'm no, I mean I'm I'm totally pleased with the way things are going. Like I I don't know. I guess just it is a little disorganized, but that makes it.